you could have a situation where you had a seller default and that would be a truly ugly thing. Now, don't think that you're going to get a short squeeze, a, a real short squeeze. Uh, what will happen is that the exchanges likely will shut down for a while and they'll cash settle. But they'll cash settle if that if that happened at a price much higher than today's price. So what what really bothers me is that you have a, a market where uh, the sort of gro gross trade position is in the billions of ounces, and the physical silver available for settlement is in the 60 or 70 million ounce range. Today, we're diving deep into the silver market, exploring the intricate dynamics that drive its movements and examining the outlook for this precious metal. Our guide for this journey is none other than Rick Rule, a seasoned investor with decades of experience in the resource sector. In a recent discussion, Rick shared his thoughts on the silver market, drawing from his extensive knowledge and understanding. So sit back, relax, and let's embark on this insightful journey into the world of silver with Rick Rule. Rick begins by highlighting the significance of the Silver Institute's research, acknowledging the limitations he and others face in comprehensively understanding the silver market. He emphasizes the primary deficit projected for 2024, estimated at approximately 1-2 billion ounces. However, he notes a crucial omission in the report, the lack of insight into above-ground inventories, particularly in regions like South Asia, where private wealth in silver remains largely undisclosed. The conversation shifts to the ramifications of low silver prices on primary silver mining and recycling. Rick underscores how depressed prices have made primary silver mining economically challenging, with most silver production stemming from byproduct mining. He explains how a recession could potentially affect both supply and demand for silver, cautioning speculators to closely monitor gold markets as they often precede movements in the silver market. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. I'm delighted with the information from the Silver Institute because neither Keith nor I have the resources to understand anything like the totality of the silver market. At the Silver Institute, they have a bunch of smart young researchers who do, who do nothing else full time. Uh, and, and the report, uh, which I've studied in some detail, is an interesting read. It talks about the fact that there's a primary deficit uh, for 2024 of approximately 1.2 billion ounces. It's important to note that the report doesn't attempt to categorize above ground inventories for the simple reason that nobody knows. A whole bunch of silver constitutes private wealth, particularly in South Asia. When people hold private wealth to shield themselves from their government, they very seldom uh, identify that private wealth to the government. So we don't know <laughs> what the above ground inventories are like. What we do know uh, is that the low price for silver has made primary silver mining, that is to say silver produced from silver mines, uneconomic or marginally economic in most cases. Most silver, in fact, is produced as a byproduct of copper mines, lead mines, zinc mines, or gold mines. And it is true that a recession, which reduced copper, lead, and zinc production, uh, would probably have a deleterious impact on silver production, but silver demand might fall too, which is to say, if you are concerned about a recession, be concerned about the silver price. It will be a mixed blessing. It will reduce supply. It might reduce demand. It is important, though, to note that the low silver price right now depresses the biggest source of silver production, which is recycling. For many industrial applications at $24 or $25 silver, the value of the money recovered in recycling operations is not enough to justify the recycling. And the industrial uses of silver are growing very rapidly. Uh, its reflective properties and conductive properties make it absolutely a, ne uh, a necessary component of solar energy, hence uh, the Chinese fascination with silver. But importantly, too, silver is a wonderful germicide, uh, and there are very rapid increases in utilization in water and wastewater treatment, in sanitation, and in medical uh, maybe the fastest growing application that we're seeing with regards to silver happens here. It's also important to note, though, that the quantum increases in silver price that we've seen occasionally in the past 
are really a, faction, uh, a, pardon me, a function of investment and speculative demand. We've noted on your show before, Dunnigan, that historically precious metals bull markets are led by gold. They're led by the fear buyer. And when the narrative gains popular currency among generalist investors, that commodity with a lower unit price, which is to say silver, begins to move further and faster. So I think silver speculators will need to watch the gold market. I think it's important, too, to note that in every currency other than the U.S. dollar, we're in a gold bull market. <laughs> uh, so I think that's important to understand. I think I've covered every point in your question, but at, at age 71, perhaps my memory failed me. I suspect that you are continuing to see leakage of physical uh, silver inventories held by individuals, particularly in South Asia, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Those societies have uh, a millennium-long uh, fascination for silver. They have a need for a store of wealth outside their domestic currencies, which are inflated away. And the consequence of that is what the silver price does well in their own currency rather than in the U.S. dollar. Uh, they often dishoard that silver. Uh, to use to meet household expenses uh, and things like that. The silver market is devilishly tough to forecast because you have to know uh, an awful lot about a lot of things. You have to know a lot about copper markets and lead markets and zinc markets. You have to know uh, about the uh, economy uh, of India. Things like a drought can actually impact silver supply as peasants dishoard their silver to feed their families. Uh, so it's important to note that even an organization like the Silver Institute that has all of the resources which it can employ studying the silver market <laughs> can very often be wrong. I don't know about the extent that will happen that that could happen. You and I have talked before, Dunnigan, about the fact that uh, futures markets and silver paper markets often trade 200 times in a day the amount of silver available for physical delivery. <laughs> Mostly, these trades don't settle in physical. Mostly, they're rolled over, uh, and only the differences are settled in physical. You could have a situation where you had a seller default, and that would be a truly ugly thing. Now, don't think that you're going to get a short squeeze, a, a real short squeeze. Uh, what will happen is that the exchanges likely <laughs> will shut down for a while, and they'll cash settle. But they'll cash settle if that if that happened at a price much higher than today's price. So what what really bothers me is that you have a, a market where uh, the sort of gro gross trade position is in the billions of ounces and the physical silver available for settlement is in the 60 or 70 million ounce range. One of the key drivers of silver demand highlighted by Rick is its growing industrial utility, especially in sectors like solar energy, water treatment, sanitation, and medical applications. He stresses the importance of recognizing silver's role beyond just a monetary asset, noting its indispensable properties in various industrial processes. Rick candidly discusses the complexities involved in forecasting the silver market, citing factors such as global economic conditions, geopolitical events, and even natural phenomena like droughts, which can impact supply. He emphasizes the need for a nuanced understanding of multiple markets, including copper, lead, and zinc, to make accurate predictions. You have the possibility for a truly severe disruption, given the extraordinary leverage in the silver market. And by the way, uh, many of the things that silver bugs traditionally identify with silver price manipulation have to do precisely with this. I'm not a believer that there's a decade long or two decade long or three decade long conspiracy to manipulate the price of silver. But I note that trade desks manipulate every market, including markets as broad as the euro dollar, the euro and the US dollar. Manipulating the silver market where you take a leveraged position, long or short, in the futures market, which is often levered three or 400 to one against the physical market, and then using borrowed physical silver to dump into the physical market at some point in time during a 25 hour period, 24 hour period, pardon me, 
where the trading volumes uh, are fairly small. In other words, you maximize the amount of damage that you do to the physical market to maximize the leverage gain that you get in the futures market. Uh, I think that's been happening continually for about 20 years. The temptation to do it where you can sell, say, $50 million worth of silver, which you have to pay interest on, to move the silver market 5 or 6% down, and then have that 5 or 6% reflected in a futures market where you have a $500 million or a $1 billion leveraged long position, uh, means that you can, if you play your cards right, uh, generate a 50% return on capital employed uh, in a two or three week period. The temptation to do this is, of course, extraordinary. And the leveraged function of the futures market makes this fairly easy for deep pocketed players, sophisticated players to accomplish. What I think is dangerous is that retail investors actually believe that they're protected by the FDC and the Commodity Futures Trading Authorities. Uh, it is beyond their scope. They can't do it. You need to protect yourself. So don't look to the government to be protected by. Look to yourself to protect yourself from, not by, your government. And take care of yourself in markets. A significant portion of the discussion centers around the issue of market manipulation in the silver market. Rick highlights the disproportionate leverage present in the futures market compared to physical silver available for delivery. He acknowledges the temptation for deep-pocketed players to exploit this leverage through short-term maneuvers, potentially causing severe disruptions. In light of these concerns, Rick emphasizes the importance of investors taking personal responsibility for their financial decisions. He cautions against relying solely on regulatory authorities for protection, urging individuals to educate themselves and make informed choices. Virtually unchanged, Dunnigan. Um, a financial planner would look at my estate and see me as the largest shareholder of Sprott uh, and a fairly substantial investor in mining shares too, and saying, why on earth would Rick Rule own gold? He's highly leveraged to gold's future. I own gold as an insurance asset. I don't own it because I think the price might go from 2000 to $2,270. I own it because I'm afraid of a circumstance that would take the nominal gold price in US dollar terms to $8,000 or $10,000. I buy it as insurance. And like any other insurance class, I actually hope I don't get paid on it. Think about it. Life insurance means somebody that died. <laughs> Auto insurance means your car got stolen or wrecked. Uh, I own gold not because I'm greedy, which I am, but rather because I'm fearful. I consider gold to be good, if volatile, liquidity. I also maintain U.S. dollar liquidity, despite the fact that I think the real rate of inflation is much higher than the stated rate of inflation. And that means that the spending power that I enjoy for the cash I save is declining, despite the fact that I might be getting a four or four and a quarter yield. I do it because I believe that the negative yield, the difference between the decline in the purchasing power and the rate of interest that I get on my savings, uh, I regard that as an option premium. Uh, I think that having cash will, if we experience a liquidity crisis, circa 2008, uh, give me both the tools and the courage to take advantage of that circumstance rather than being taken advantage of by that circumstance. So I continue to hold both gold and short-term uh, U.S. dollar-denominated savings products for liquidity.